Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for the receptivity of everyone. We're here. We learn. We apply. We have grace in our lives. And we obey. And I'm asking, Lord, that once again today, you'll enrich every life with the word of God in Jesus' name. Bless us one and all in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at the Psalms. And we're looking at quite a number of Psalms today. Six altogether. Psalm 16, Psalm 17, Psalm 18, Psalm 19, Psalm 20, and Psalm 21. Quite a lot. And I pray that the Lord himself will open your eyes as he has opened my eyes to see the riches of the word of God. As you look at the word today, there is one word that is very important, very interesting, very instructive to you. It's the word trust. And that's why the message today is trusting the living God with the whole heart. In whatever situation we find ourselves, in whatever predicament we might find ourselves, in this time and at all times, we can trust the Lord and we trust Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and things will never be the same. Let me just read some verses to you in each of the chapters we're looking at today. We're looking at Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for indeed do I put my trust. Look at Psalm 17, verse 7. It says, Show me, show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Look at Psalm 18, verse 2. In Psalm 18, verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, in whom I will trust, my buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. That same psalm, look at verse 30. In verse 30, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Then in Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Look at Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 21 now, verse 7. It says, For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. As you look at all those verses we have read, you'll find the central thought and the central word and the central point, trusting in the Lord, trusting the living God with the whole heart. As we think about trusting the Lord and as we plan on trusting the Lord more and as we understand, comprehend, trusting the Lord more and more with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, Trusting him completely and fully. Trusting the Lord unreservedly. There are three things we're going to look at as we look at these Psalms. Number one, the preservation of trusting saints in righteousness. It preserves us in righteousness. It preserves us in redemption. It preserves us in all the provision of Calvary. And as it preserves us, we keep on trusting him. The preservation of trusting saints in righteousness. Point number two, the perception 
of the triumphant strays of our rock. Already we read in Psalm 18 verse 2, He is my God, He is my rock, He is my fortress. And we need to perceive, we need to understand the triumphant strength of that our rock. Then point number three is the perfection of our trustworthy Savior and Redeemer. The perfection of everything coming from the Savior and the Redeemer is salvation, is perfection. And is a sustainers, is perfection. His promises, is perfection. Everything that comes from him, he tends to perfect everything concerning you. And from today, he, the perfect one, will perfect everything concerning you, concerning your family, and concerning your spiritual life. In Jesus' name, the perfection of our trustworthy Savior, our Redeemer. We're coming to point number one now. Point number one is the preservation of trusting saints in righteousness. Look at the words there. Number one is the word sage. You know, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were all sinners, but then the power of God got hold of us and turned us around and changed us, and then he makes us saints because he puts righteousness in our heart. Salvation and righteousness, they go together. Regeneration and righteousness, they go together. And redemption and righteousness, they go together. And as we become saints in the Lord and saints in the kingdom of God, he grants us righteousness and he preserves us in that righteousness. We're looking at, uh, you know, about seven things over here in the word of God as we look at Psalm 16, uh, which builds the foundation, the foundation of our relationship with God, the foundation of our redemption, and the foundation of righteousness in the Lord. There are seven things we're looking at. Number one, personal relationship with the Lord personal relationship with the Lord. Look at Psalm 16 from verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust, my trust. You are my Savior, you are my shepherd, and I put my trust in you. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord. Personal relationship, thou art at my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. Maybe you don't understand that sentence when he says, my goodness extendeth not unto thee. He said, my goodness, whatever I can do, my good works, whatever I can do, my self-righteousness, whatever I can do, cannot reach unto God, cannot extend unto God. On the other hand, is the righteousness of God that extends to us, is the grace of God that extends to us, is the goodness of God that extends to us. He says, you are my Lord. You became my Lord, not because of the goodness of my hand that extended unto you, but of your grace we are saved and through faith and that not of ourselves it is the gift of God look at verse 3 there in verse 3 it says but to the saints that are in the earth and you see there are people that think that only saints can only be in heaven that when you die you become saint Augustine you become saint Paul you become saint John he says while we're on earth here because of salvation while we're on earth here because we know the Lord it says but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight and look at Psalm 50 verse 5 in Psalm 50 verse 5, it, the Lord is now taking possession of those saints. He says, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. That's what brought the uh, personal relationship that we became saints of God. We were, not, we were not sinners anymore. Our lives are changed. Our lives are transformed. And it says, gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Number two is the peculiar resources as our Lord. Peculiar resources as our Lord. We come into the kingdom of God. 
And then he makes himself and he makes all his provision, our resources. And that becomes our Lord. I come back to Psalm 16. We're reading from verse 5. In Psalm 16, verse 5, he tells us the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my Lord. Thou maintainest my Lord. We have peculiar resources because now God grants us resources. He grants us the riches of the kingdom, unsearchable riches of the kingdom. And thou maintainest my Lord. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it tells us the lines are falling unto me in pleasant places. Yea, yes, I have a goodly heritage. And then in verse 7, in verse 7, it says, I will bless the Lord. Lord who has given me counsel, he gives me admonition, he gives me instruction, he gives me solution to all the perplexities of my life, and I will bless the Lord, he has given me counsel, my reigns also instruct me in the night seasons, and now in verse 8, look at verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me. He grants me peculiar resources, so I set him up before me all the time. Is there any a crossroad? I set him before me. Is there any temptation? I set the Lord before me. Is there sickness? I set the Lord my healer before me. Is there persecution? I set the Lord before me. I have set the Lord always, always, always before me because it's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. The wind will not move you. Persecution will not move you. Suffering will not move you. Sickness will not move you. He is always at your right hand and he will accomplish everything he ought to accomplish in your life in Jesus' name. And there's something I wanted to mark in Psalm 125, Psalm 125, verses 3 and 4. Look at Psalm 125 and we're looking at verse 3. It says, For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the Lord of the righteous. I'm sure you are marking that in your Bible, the rod of the wicked, the rod of the powers of darkness will not come upon you, will not come upon your family. The name of the Lord will preserve you and protect you. The rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the Lord of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Look at verse 4. It says in verse 4, Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good. They're good by grace. They're good by faith. They're good because of salvation. And do good, O Lord, unto those that be good and to them that are upright in their hearts. Let's look at number three now. Perpetual rejoicing in the path of life. Perpetual rejoicing in the path of life. We're coming back to Psalm 16 and we're looking at verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad. Therefore, because the Lord is my resources, because the Lord is my provider, because I set the Lord before me all the days of my life, every moment, every time, always, I set the Lord before me. Therefore, because of that, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, Thou will show me the path of life. Thou will show me the path of life. No confusion will catch you and no confusion will destabilize your life. The Lord will show you the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. There's a reason for this, number four now, and he's talking about, uh, he's talking about the predicted resurrection of our librator. Look at um, Psalm uh, 16, we're reading from verse 10. In Psalm 16, verse 10, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in Sheol, 
in the grave, neither will thou suffer thine holy one, thine holy one. You see that? He's talking about somebody else. This is not David now. Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is referring to the resurrection of our Lord, of our liberator. Let me show you that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, reading from verse 27. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell in the grave, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That's exactly a quotation from Psalm 16, verse 10. Look at the explanation now. In verse 28, it says in verse 28, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy by with thy countenance. Verse 29, in verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, of the king David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. In verse 30, it says, therefore, being a prophet, is talking about David, being a prophet is talking about the position he held when he wrote Psalm 16. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had shown him with an oath to him as one, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up resurrection, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Verse 31, then says he, seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. That's talking about, that's the predicted resurrection of our Christ, of our Lord, of our liberator. Let's come back to the Psalms. In Psalm 17, we're looking at verse 3. Psalm 17, verse 3, purposeful restraint of our lips. It says in Psalm 17, verse 3, thou has proved mine heart, thou has visited me in the night, thou has tried me, tested me, and shall find nothing. Why? Because I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Here is the psalmist saying, I have a personal relationship with the Lord, I have peculiar resources as my Lord, and I have also a perpetual rejoicing in the path of life, and I believe in the Redeemer, in his own case, in the Redeemer to come, in the Liberator to come, but now he says, we have already, we see that Christ died and he was buried and he rose again for justification. Now we have faith in him because he has turned us from sinners unto sins. He has given us redemption. He has given us righteousness. And now we are purposed in our heart that our mouth shall not transgress. Purposeful restraint of our lives. It tells us in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Concerning the works of men, by the words of thy lips have I kept me from the path of the destroyer. The psalmist is saying, I'm restraining myself, and then I'm restricting myself. I will not walk in the path of the destroyer. I'm going to show evidence that Christ lives in me, that the Lord is my Savior, that the Lord is my liberator. And because of that, I'm not going to just move here and there and be unequally yoked together with the destroyers, with the works of it, with the workers of iniquity. I keep myself from the paths of the destroyer. And then it says in verse five, in verse five, hold up my goings in thy path. I appeal to your grace, I appeal to your power, and I plead for your strength that you will hold my goings in thy path for my footsteps, that my footsteps sleep not. I don't want to sleep, I don't want to backslide, I don't want to go back to the old rut in which I was, I want you to hold me up. The Lord will hold you up. You see, we need to restrain ourselves. And we need to consciously 
and deliberately hold herself back from any path of sin. In fact, we are told in First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. It says in verse 10 of First Peter chapter 3, it says, For he, will, he that will love life and see good days, let him, let him refrain his tongue from evil, refrain his tongue from evil in the family, refrain his tongue from evil, from slander, from backbiting, from gossip. It says, restrain yourself. It was possible for the psalmist, it's possible for you too. And his lips that they speak no girl, because we're told in verse 11, in verse 11, let him eschew evil, let him shun evil, let him detest evil, let him avoid evil and do good, let him seek peace and ensue it. Verse 12 tells us why. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil and let's come to number six what we're considering power powerful rescue from the lions powerful rescue from the lions it tells us in uh, Psalm 17 and we're looking at verse 8 Psalm 17 verse 8 it says keep me as the apple of thine eye Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Here is the prayer he prayed, and here is the prayer you need to pray, that the Lord all the time will keep you. He'll keep you as the apple of his eye. Uh, you understand? Uh, the apple of your eye, that's your eyeball. There are, um, you know, lids there, eye, eyelashes there that help you. You close the eyes whenever there is anything that will hurt your eyeball. And the Lord is taking you as delicate, as precious, as important as the eye. And then he's going to keep you as the apple of his eye. Hide me. He will hide you under his shadow, the shadow of his wings. And no evil will come upon you. Look at verse 9 there. In verse 9 it says, From the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who compass me about. The Lord is saying that he will keep you. And so when you go to pray, you tell the Lord, keep me, preserve me from my deadly enemies, from the deadly enemies who compass me about. And then in verse 10, in verse 10, they are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouths they speak proudly. They brag, they boast, and they say they can destroy anyone. They can scatter any family. They can make anyone sorrowful, sad, and defeated. They boast because their mouth speak pr proudly. And then in verse 11, in verse 11, they have now compassed us in our steps. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth. And then in verse 12, he compares them to a lion. He says, like a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were, a young lion locking in secret places. And yet, you know, the Lord will deliver you. And the Lord can deliver you out of the hands of those roaring lions. The Lord already conquered them on the cross of Calvary. And all the lions, you know what the Lord is saying? There is no enemy that can be more powerful than that so-called lion. There is no enemy that can be more devastating, destructive as that so-called lion. And the Lord said, he will deliver you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 17. And look at the testimony of Paul, which becomes your testimony. It says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. The Lord will stand by you. The Lord will stand with you. Anything you are going through, any enemy that uh, will try to crush you and crush your life, the Lord will stand by you. Paul, the apostle, testified, and the testimony passes unto you, notwithstanding, the Lord, the, uh, the Lord stood with me, strengthening me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I 
was delivered. Mark this in your Bible. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And he will deliver you out of the mouth of the lion. Look at verse, seven, verse 18. In verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work if there remains any other sin that is still coming around the corner. He has delivered me in the past and the Lord shall deliver me out from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. I could almost hear your amen. Amen. The Lord will do it in Jesus' name. Look at something in First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. In First Peter chapter 5, you have something to do, and this is verse 8. In First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober. Uh, that, that, that's, that's your area. That's your work. Don't walk carelessly. Don't talk flippantly. Don't just move about here and there, roaming about, but be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, as a running lion, he delivered David, he delivered Paul, he's going to deliver you. That your adversary, the devil, as a running lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, he will not find you. He will not touch you. He will not crush your bones. You are going to be preserved in Jesus' name. It says in verse 9, look at what we do. Whom receives steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Look at number 7 now. Is the present righteousness in his likeness, we're coming back to Psalm 17. In Psalm 17, verse 15, it says, As for me, you can say that, as for me, every believer can say that, as for me, as for you, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness shall and shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. Present righteousness in his likeness. It says, I, I will behold thy righteousness from now until next week, until next month, until next year, as long as Jesus tarries, as long as you live in this veil of darkness, in the shadow of darkness, as you are still in the world here, you keep on beholding because you set the Lord before you all the time. And then you say, when I awake, I shall awake with thy likeness. And then when eventually that day of resurrection comes, when the day of rapture comes and the Lord is calling his own home, you awake in his likeness. As for me, make up your mind. As for me, I will not look back. As for me, I will not backslide. As for me, I will not allow anything to make me me go back turn back as for me i will behold thy face in righteousness i shall be satisfied it will satisfy you it will supply your need it will saturate you with the blessings of god i shall be satisfied when i awake with thy likeness that's point number one we're coming to point number two now point number two is the perception of the triumphant strength of our rock he is our rock you know and when um, Peter gave testimony to who the Lord was. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He builds you on the rock. That rock has strength. And they were told, the rock that followed them was Christ. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, all those people, they, uh, they got water out of the rock, miracle water out of the rock. They got supply of abundant water of life out of the rock. And the rock that followed them is Christ. He is our rock. Look at uh, Psalm 18. We're reading from verses 1 and 2. In verse 18, verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Look at verse 2. Because in verse 2 it says, the Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My buckler 
and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. As we perceive, as we comprehend, as we understand, as we gaze at the Lord, our rock, and we behold this triumphant strength, we're looking at three things. Number one, the triumph of our mighty deliverer. The triumph of our mighty deliverer. Number two is the testimony of our miraculous deliverance. The testimony of our miraculous deliverance. And number three, the time of our marvelous dispensation let's come to number one is the triumph of our mighty deliverer we're looking at psalm 18 verses one two and three verse one i will love thee O lord my strength and then in verse two he says the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer quite a lot there and my god and my strength in whom I will trust my buckler, my horn of salvation, my high tower. Hold on. In that verse 2. Look at that verse 2. And look at the various descriptions of God. So that whatever your situation and whatever your peculiarity and whatever your challenge, you will find that God is the answer. That the Lord is the solution, is the rock, you can hide in that rock. Is the fortress and no enemy can besiege that fortress and overcome. And once you are hidden there, your life is secured. It's your deliverer. Even if the enemy has you, if the lion has you in the teeth, in the jaws of his mouth, the Lord is able to deliver. He is your God, the creator of heavens and earth who created the whole universe, is able to recreate your life. He is your God. He is your strength. No matter weak you think you are, in your weakness, it becomes your strength. In whom I will trust is my buckler, is my shield. And whatever is thrown at you, that buckler and that shield will protect you and prevent every harm in your life. He is the horn of your salvation. The horn there stands for power. The horn, you see the horns of the, of the animals, they use that to fight and they use that to conquer any other animal that will attack them is for power. In the power, in the horn of thy salvation, and he is my high tower. You remember, he says, when the enemy comes, the righteous runneth into that tower and is safe and is secure. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, I will call upon the Lord. Uh, the, the, the psalmist is talking with confidence. He's not saying, well, I'm going to pray. I don't know whether the Lord will answer or not. I'm going to pray. I don't know whether the answer will come or not. He was sure, and you ought to be sure, that our God is a loving Father. Our God is a loving God. Our God is a loving Redeemer. He will answer your prayer. Even today, even today, whatever you open your your mouth to tell the Lord, the Lord will surprise you with a miracle. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. He will save you from all enemies in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 74. Luke chapter 1, verse 74, it says that he will grant unto us. You can put your name there. I can put my name there that he will grant unto you, that he will grant unto me, that he will grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. Everything holding us back, everything is not broken. Everything holding you back, everything is not broken. He delivers from our enemies that we might serve him without fear. Look at verse 75. How do we serve him in holiness and righteousness before him? Tell me the rest over there. I said, read the last words over there. All the days of our life, I will not backslide. You will not backslide. We will not turn back. We will not go back. Whatever the challenge by prayer, by faith, we're going to overcome. And we will continue to serve the Lord in holiness and righteousness. 
all the days of our life. He has done it, and you will see the effect in your life in Jesus' name. Look at Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 13, who has delivered us. That's me. I said that's me. Why don't you say that's yours? Who has delivered you from the power of darkness and he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. When did that happen? Look at verse 14. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He has forgiven your sins. He has saved your soul. He has brought you into the kingdom. You are redeemed. And because of that, he has translated you out of the kingdom of darkness and he has brought you into the kingdom of his dear son. Let's come back to the Psalms, Psalm 18. And we're reading from verse 6. Here is the testimony of a miraculous deliverance. He delivers. He'll put testimony in your mouth. And you know, you must testify. You must testify. Don't just say, you see, I praise God in the corner of my room, come out, and then before all the other believers, like uh, David, like the psalmist gave testimony, he said, I have testimony of miraculous deliverance in uh, Psalm 18, verse 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. He says, can I give you my testimony? I prayed, I cried, I called, and he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even into his ears. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, he continues with the testimony. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. In verse 17, he says, he delivered me from my strong enemy. That will be your testimony. That was his testimony. And he said, I'm telling you, this God is mighty. And he is my rock. And he is my shield. He is my buckler. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. They were too strong for me. Hold on. Not too strong for my Lord. They were too strong for me. Not too strong for my God. They were too strong for me. Not too strong for my Redeemer. Not too strong for my Deliverer. Because of that, no matter how strong those enemies are, deliverance have come, has come unto you and for you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, they prevented me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. In verse 19, it says, He brought me forth also into a large place they wanted to confine him they wanted to restrict him they wanted to push him and make him stay and pin him down in a corner so that he will not spread his wings and the lord said no that confinement is not for you i said that confinement is not for you and he brought him forth is going to bring you forth is going to bring you out. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And you say, I wish the Lord will delight in me. He delights in you. That's why as you come to the New Testament, he calls you beloved, beloved, beloved in number of times. He delights in you. He will deliver you. Are you sick? Today is going to deliver you from that sickness. Are you harassed? Are you tormented? Are you oppressed? Today is going to deliver you from that harassment because he delights in you. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says that Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hand, uh, as he recompensed me. Verse 21, uh, in verse 21, it says, For I have kept the ways of the Lord 
I have not wickedly departed from my God. As long as I keep staying with my God, he delivers. As long as I keep staying with my God, he overcomes all the challenges in my life. Look at verse 32. In verse 32, it is God that guides me with strength. You'll be stronger today than you were yesterday. You'll be stronger for the challenges before you today at the present time than any other time in your life. It is God that guides me with strength and maketh my way perfect. Underline that, that's for you. He maketh my way perfect. Every crookedness and every imperfection and every difficulty, every turn meandering in the way, he'll make your way perfect. Every pothole, he was going to to level everything, every valley is going to level everything and is going to make your way perfect. Look at verse 35. In verse 35, here is the psalmist saying, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Here the psalmist is giving testimony and is to lead you to also examine your life and count your blessings and see all that the Lord has done for you. Rather than saying, I don't have this, I don't have this, don't look at what you don't have yet. Look at what you have. Look at what you possess and look at the great things the Lord has done for you. Thou hast given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand has holding me up and thy gentleness has made me great and thy gentleness has made me great. You know, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter there, there are people in the world, they think like the world, they think when they are aggressive, they're going to become great. They think when they are violent, they're going to become great. But the Lord said, I am lowly and I'm meek and I will give rest unto your soul. And he says, learn of me. And when the gentleness of Christ comes into you, actually, you will go places, you will climb mountains, you will cross oceans. When the gentleness of the Lord comes upon you, you're not fighting for anything. You're not aggressive for anything. Everything that is meant for you will come to you. And the gentleness of the Lord will make you great. I'm looking now at number three in this section, the time of our marvelous dispensation. We're looking at uh, Psalm 18. We're reading verse 37. And we're reading verse 40. We're looking at Psalm 18. And we're reading verse 37. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. Hold on there now. You see, there are people, they do not understand the dispensation of that time and the dispensation of this time. Here David said, in his own dispensation, at his own time, under the old covenant, I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. You see, uh, the Lord is telling us we need to recognize the dispensation in which we live. I'll show you that later. Look at verse 40. In verse 40, it says, in verse 40, Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies. In that dispensation, that's how they dealt with enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. That was their dispensation. Look at our own dispensation now. Ephesians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself. Verse 10, in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and are on earth, even in him. He's talking about a new dispensation. The old dispensation is gone. 
the dispensation of the patriarchs of old, of the princes of old, of the prophets of old, all that dispensation has been swept aside. Now we have the new dispensation. Look at uh, chapter 3. We're looking at chapter 3 of Ephesians and we're looking at verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, what? It says now, the dispensation of the grace of God. That's the time we're living now. From the time of the cross, from the time at Calvary, when Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A new dispensation began from the time of Christ when he said, it is finished. A new dispensation began from the time when the Holy Ghost came upon those disciples and the church became energized, empowered by the Holy Ghost. A new dispensation began from the time when Jesus said, now go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every creature, every creature, to the Jew and to the Gentile, to the near and to the farther away. Now a new dispensation started if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word. Then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. And then in verse 4, it says in verse 4, whereby when you read, when you read the word of God, no, this is the dispensation in which we are living now, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, in this dispensation, what do we do? That dispensation of the time of David, we have seen what they did, how they dealt with enemies, how they crushed their enemies, how they put their feet on the neck of their enemies, how they snuffed life out of their enemies. What do we do now in our own dispensation? Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 43. It says, Ye have heard that it had been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. You have heard of another dispensation of the past. Love your neighbor, hate thine enemy. A new dispensation has now come with the coming of Christ. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. A new dispensation has now come. In verse 45, it says that she may be the children of your father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're reading from verse 20. Here is what we do now in our own dispensation. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If thine enemy hunger, don't say that's good for him. That's another dispensation. And don't say he will starve to death. That's another dispensation. In this, our dispensation now, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. In verse 21, in verse 21 it says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't pay them back in their own coins. Don't strike the enemy as he has tried to strike you. He has done evil, repay with good and overcome evil with good. And you will have a testimony. You will discover the strength of the Lord and the Lord himself will preserve you in Jesus' name. Let's come back to the Psalms. We're coming to point number three now. In point number three, we're looking at the perfection 
of our trustworthy Savior and Redeemer. The perfection of our trustworthy Savior and Redeemer. Look at Psalm 19 verse 7. Please open your Bible, Psalm 19 verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Hold on there. Now, as a child of God, what directs us? What motivates us? What instructs us is the law of the Lord because that is the only perfect thing. As you look at any man, any man in the past, any man at present, you're not going to see perfection just hanging around everywhere. If you're going to be directed, if you're going to be controlled by that which is perfect, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. You see, the lives of people around, whoever they are, they might be great people, they might be popular people, they might be influential people. In whatever section of life they might be, you'll find imperfection in their lives. That's the reason why you will not be directed, you will not be controlled, and you will not be moved by the lives of other people. I want to be like so and so. Uh -uh, that's not enough. I want to be like such and such. That's not enough. It says it is the law of the Lord that is perfect, and that is what converts the soul. When you look at the watch of the Lord, when you look at the law of the Lord, and you look at your life, you see how you are very far away from the perfect will and the perfect wisdom and the perfect word of God and that will bring conviction to the heart and then you say, Lord, if I continue like this, all the knowledge I've got in the education of the world, all the examples I've got in all the heroes of the world and all the practices I've seen in all the communities in the world, they have not helped me uh, to be uh, nearer and nearer unto you and this law of the Lord now comes to me the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple you see well like uh, I'm trying to use the right word uh, let me give you the word well like we're stupid it's like we are simple terms we know nothing and we, be, we behave foolishly. It is when the testimony of the Lord comes in uh, that makes us, gives us assurance and we now know this is the way, what he in it, all our simple turn and all our simplicity and all our stupidity, everything will vanish away. All our sinfulness will vanish away. It says the testimony of the Lord is sure and it makes wise the simple. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us the statutes of the Lord are right. The statutes of the Lord are right. I cannot say that about the behavior you see in the community and about the practices you see in the community, about the actions and reactions you see in the community, but you can say this about the statutes of the Lord. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's the commandment of the Lord, it's the word of the Lord that is going to set us right. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but then we're justified freely by faith in the word, in the sacrifice of the Lord. In fact, it tells us now, after we're justified, the way we move and the way we act in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 9. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 9. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man, a young woman, wherewithal shall a young person, an older person too, wherewithal shall a person is a child of God, cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. According to thy word. You know, when you switch over to the word of of the Lord you're eating or drinking and anything you do you do it according to thy word you are friends you are making friends and you do it according to thy word and you are having relationship fellowship with other people you do it according to thy word you are doing uh, every action of life anywhere you are you are guided by the word of God you take heed there too according to thy word look at verse 11 in verse 11 
it tells us thy word have I hid in my heart, thy word have I kept in my heart, thy word have I holding in my heart, have I held in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It is that word that gives us real assurance that now we have the purging and we have the preservation in the way of the Lord. We're coming to the second section, that's the provision of liberality by the Lord. The provision of liberality by the Lord. We come back to the Psalm, Psalm 20, and we're looking at verse 1. Psalm 20, verse 1, the Lord hear thee in the day of thy trouble. I'm, I'm talking about you, and I'm reading the word concerning you, that in the day of your trouble, even before that trouble comes, the Lord will hear you. In the day of trouble, the name of the God of Jacob defend thee. You understand that? The same name of God, God Almighty, that defended the children of Israel before Pharaoh and defended them at the Red Sea and defended them before the Amalekites. That same name having the same power, having the same authority, having the same bulldozing um, potentiality, that same name of the God of Jacob will defend you. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, He'll send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Strength is coming coming to you today. Strength has come to you already today and the Lord will empower you and the Lord will take away every chain and every shackle out of your life in Jesus name. In verse 3, it tells us in verse 3, it says, he will remember all thy offerings, everything you have done, the little and the big everything you have done in the house of God, everything you have done for the service of God, everything you have done to alleviate the suffering and the poverty of other people, everything you have done to help anyone, everything you have done and you have offered unto the Lord. It says he will remember all thy offerings and accept thy bond sacrifice. Selah, that selah means pause and think about that that nothing you have done for the glory of God will be in vain. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. The Lord will grant you according to your heart, according to the desire, according to your demand. Everything you are praying for, everything you are asking, the Lord is saying, He is your liberator and he is your liberality, and he is going to supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He will grant you according to your own heart. He will fulfill all your counsel. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, we will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Don't go away from that verse yet. Let me read it to you and make it personal. I will rejoice in your salvation. Can you say that? I will rejoice in your salvation. In the name of my God, I will set up my banners. The Lord fulfill all my petitions. He'll answer your prayer, or your prayers he will answer, and the Lord will do good unto you. Every area of your life spiritual, every area of your life natural, every area of your life physical, every area of your life educational, every area of your life professional, the Lord will fulfill all thy petitions. Look at verse 6. In verse 6 it says, Now know I that the Lord saveth is anointed, he will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Verse 7, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That name has been given to you. And Jesus said, Whatsoever 
you will ask in my name, he will give it to you. Your prayers are answered in Jesus' name. It's going to preserve you. Number three there is the preservation of life in the Lord. Your life is in the Lord and is going to preserve your life. Look at uh, Psalm 21, and we're reading from verse 4. Psalm 21, reading from verse 4, He has life of thee, and thou gavest it him, even lays of days forever and ever. He has life of thee, you ask of the Lord, and he's going to give you life. And then he says, he gives it to him, even lays of days, even lays of days forever and ever. Let me hear your amen. Amen. Look at Psalm 91, and I'm reading from verse 16. Psalm 91, we're reading from verse 16. It says in Psalm 91, verse 16, with long life, will I satisfy him? It's talking about you. With long life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? It will happen. It has happened in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 10, verse 10. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That abundant life has now come for you. And that life will be preserved until you see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In verse 2, it says, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3, it says in verse 3, For ye are dead, and your life is set with Christ in God. Ye are dead, the old life is dead, the weakened life is dead. All the depraved life is dead. Ye are dead. And your life, your new life, your risen life, your resurrected life, your revived life, your spiritual life, your righteous life is now hid with Christ in God. In verse 4 it says, And when Christ, who is our life, Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I see glory upon your life, glory in your heart, glory as you draw nearer and nearer unto the Lord. And when Christ shall appear in glory, you, by the grace of God, we, all of us, by the grace of God, we will appear with him in glory. We will not do anything disgraceful, anything degradating, anything degrading, anything uh, that will bring us to shame, uh, but now glory, glory all the way, because he has given us everything that pertains to righteousness, everything that pertains to godliness, everything that pertains to virtue, everything that pertains to glory. And that glory will remain and abide in your life in Jesus' name. We're going to take whatever we have learned today to the Lord in prayer. And we believe that everything the Lord has said, everything the Lord has revealed, everything the Lord has told us and taught us in these Psalms, we're going to take to the Lord, trust the Lord, the living God, with your whole heart, He will fulfill all your petition. Let's rise up. Let's talk to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, I thank you. I know you are for me. I'm for you. I thank you because you have given me a perception of who you are and of what I have, personal relationship with the Lord. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my righteousness. Thank you because I believe with the death of my heart, with no shadow of unbelief, I believe my name is written in the book of life in heaven. And your grace is sufficient for me. Now I have peculiar resources 
as my lot and the lot of the wicked will not rest upon you, will not rest upon me, the lot of the evil and the lot that comes upon unbelievers will not come upon your life and there will be perpetual rejoicing. You rejoice because your name is written in the book of life in heaven. And you rejoice because now by his grace and his strength, you are walking perpetually in the path of life. And then Christ predicted that he was going to rise from the dead. He has risen from the dead for justification. He has risen from the dead for our salvation. And because of that, everything he provided on Calvary can now be yours, can now be mine. And then you are walking with restraint. You restrain your tongue. You restrain your lips. You restrain your conversation. And you make sure, that doesn't mean you'll not talk. That doesn't mean you'll just be quiet all through the day. You restrain your tongue from evil. And you only say, if you cannot say anything good about somebody, then don't talk at all. If you cannot say anything good about your situation, then don't talk. Just go and tell the Lord about that. You restrain your leaves. And then the Lord is going to give you a powerful rescue from the lions, from all the lions. And then he's going to give you present righteousness in his likeness while awake in his righteousness. Your perception of the strength of the Lord, perception of the triumphant strength of the Lord, the Lord is strong and mighty, stronger than your enemy, stronger than your peculiarities, and stronger than any oppression that may come upon your life. Now you can walk free. You are fortified. Because the Lord is your rock. The Lord is your strength. The Lord is the horn, the power of your salvation. The Lord is your mighty tower, your high tower. The Lord is the immovable or movable rock. And the Lord is the provider, the provider of all your needs. He will put testimony in your mouth for the triumph he brings in your life. Now you understand the time of our dispensation. You're not doing like David said he was going to do to his enemy. He lived in another dispensation. But now the Lord has given you the water of life to go and serve those people, friends and enemies, neighbors and strangers, the Lord has given you the bread of life to go and serve all those people, foes or friends. The Lord has given you the grace to go and share with all your neighbors, whether they are up or down, whether they are on the left side or on the right side, whether they have spoken against you before or they have spoken on, on your behalf before, the Lord has made you an ambassador of the grace and the gospel of God. And now you have the understanding of the perfection of the triumphant Savior and the triumphant Redeemer and he has provided everything for you. He purges us, he cleanses us, he prepares us for that glorious day. All the provision you need, he liberally provides. And he'll meet all your need. My God shall supply all your needs. I almost mentioned your name. If I knew your name, I'll mention your name. The Lord will supply the need of brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, he'll supply your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Believe that it is done. He will grant you all your petition and he will preserve your life unto the glorious final day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your revelation today. And we thank you because you've called us again to come and trust you with the whole heart. No reservation. 
no doubting, no wavering, no unbelief. We trust you with all our heart that everything that concerns us, everything that concerns my brother there, my sister there, my son, my daughter there, everything that concerns everyone, you will perfect in Jesus' name. We pray that all the prayers of your people you will answer. And we pray you strengthen everyone, energize everyone. We pray there will be assurance of salvation assurance of redemption, assurance of your strength, assurance of sanctification and holiness, assurance of victory, victory over every difficulty, assurance of deliverance in every danger, assurance of crushing, assurance of destroying every power of Satan and every power of the lion. You give us assurance our prayers are answered already. We cannot walk in the grace of God and we can move on in the path of life, rejoicing every time. And our life, the life of everyone, every one of your children is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ shall appear, all of us without exception, by your grace and your strength, we shall appear with the Lord in glory. Confirm it, Lord, in every life. Put joy in every life, testimony in every mouth. Like the psalmist testified, I pray that your people too will have real, definite testimony of mighty, present day deliverance in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. The Lord be with you and fulfill all your petition, answer all your prayers in Jesus' name.